thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee to, uh, for having me or giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, the topic uh, that I was asked to talk about was moisture damage in asphalt. If you look outside, the weather is perfect uh, for the topic. Uh, when I was preparing the presentation, though, I was in Texas and looking outside, it was 40 degrees weather, <clears throat> bright sun shining, not a single cloud, and I was thinking about moisture damage, but this is better. Uh, it inspires you to think. So thank you once again for uh, the invitation and thank you all for being here this afternoon. We start with this picture. My outline is very simple, just two topics. I would like to, in my presentation, what I'd like to do is instead of uh, focusing on one specific aspect or one specific part of moisture damage, what I'd like to do is to talk about the story, the mechanism, the different pieces of puzzle that come together to create the end result. You want it louder? Okay. To create the end result that we know as uh, moisture damage. Here is a picture. Um, uh, here, here's an interesting picture. This is a crew, uh, a road maintenance crew going out to fix potholes and uh, their vehicle got stuck in a pothole. Um, and uh, that's the irony of things. <coughs> So I, two simple parts of my presentation, about two-thirds of the presentation, I will tell you the story about mechanism, just what uh, we believe or what our understanding today is about what causes moisture damage. The remaining one-third, uh, I will talk about applications. Also, before I start, I'd like to mention that instead of focusing on one or two niche depth areas, what I decided to do for this presentation was to somehow uh, capture a number of different studies conducted by several esteemed colleagues, many of or some of them are here, right here in this room, uh, over the years and synthesize them into this one story. So uh, I was very fortunate to work alongside many of these individuals who I will cite as we go along over the past many years and uh, to, to work with them, learn with them, and, and sort of piece together this puzzle, this mystery that we call moisture damage. Uh, a small disclaimer before I proceed is that my focus is on materials. Although if you think about moisture damage, it is a combination of material, construction, and structure that causes moisture damage. You can have the best material in the world, and you can put it or you, cannot, you may build it incorrectly and you will have problems. You may have the best material and you build it correctly, uh, but you put it in a structure where water stagnates and you have a lot of uh, you know, water issues, uh, you will still have problems. Um, as a side note, I would also like to mention that there is currently a, a National Cooperative Highway Research Program, an NCHRP study in the, in the United States. Uh, I'm serving as a panel member for that study. Uh, which sort of synthesizes all the different things that come together, uh, starting right from structure, construction, materials, uh, and that influence moisture damage, and what are the practices that different state Department of Transportation in the U.S. have used to mitigate this problem at each one of these three length scales. My story today will restrict to materials. I will not get into construction and, or structures. Uh, I know I stand between... Uh, coffee break and, and now so you can count down the slides over here. You can see if you're too desperate for coffee. Uh, so we'll start with a simple pavement structure. We got a pavement, we got a vehicle load, uh, and, and the story starts with uh, looking closely at the material itself, which is the asphalt mixture composite. And moisture damage obviously starts with moisture. There is a subtle difference between liquid water and moisture. I do not have the time to get into that and how it affects, but for the time being, let's say we are using them interchangeably. So we'll start with moisture. Somehow moisture gets into the system. It works its way through the pores or capillaries within the asphalt mixture. In this cartoon here, I've shown water or moisture getting in from the top of the pavement, but that may not be the case always. Right now, perhaps there is a pavement somewhere that is soaking in water from the top, but if you have saturated soil or foundation, water can make its way in the reverse direction from the bottom as well. This part of the story, or this part of the mechanism, we'll refer to as moisture transport. That is the first step, is water gets into the system. 
The next part of the story is once water gets into the system, you have a number of different phenomena taking place. Uh, you can have erosion, diffusion, cohesive softening, and so forth. So if you think about it, here is a schematic uh, that shows uh, a small air void or a capillary right next to the mortar, right next to the coarse aggregate particle. So when you start the process, you can have vehicle loads, uh, I'm sorry, you can have vehicle loads that uh, create a pumping action that causes this water to flow in and out of that capillary, causing some kind of an erosion. Simultaneously, water is also diffusing and making its way through the mortar all the way to the coarse aggregate particle. Uh, so this part of the story we call diffusion. As the moisture diffuses, it tends to soften the material, it tends to reduce its mechanical integrity, mechanical properties, and weaken it. Uh, the last step is once uh, the moisture makes its way to the coarse aggregate particle, you see its effect, what we commonly call as a stripping, where the moisture gradually peels off the asphalt from the aggregate surface. And this is driven by thermodynamics, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, you have water getting into the, between the interface of the bitumen and the, and the aggregate. Water is a very polar liquid and thermodynamically it prefers to get into these interfaces. So let's start our story about moisture transport. Uh, so moisture transport is generally, if you look at the literature and you read about it, the terms diffusion and moisture transport are used interchangeably. Uh, and, and rightfully so perhaps. Uh, I think the subtle difference between these two terms is simply length scale. I personally prefer to use the word transport when we are talking about a larger length scale where we are thinking about macroscopic air voids and capillaries and moisture traveling through these entities. So uh, first of all, when you read literature and you look up this mechanism, you might see the term diffusion, but let's think of it as moisture transport. Uh, the second thing is how does water get into or how does it travel into the mixture? And there are a number of mechanisms or driving forces. The first would be uh, pressure. Uh, you could have the, uh, a vehicle moving over uh, a saturated pore that sort of pressurizes the water into the mix. You could have simple capillary action which could work both from the water from the top or water from the bottom. Uh, you could have a relative humidity gradient which is simply because you have high relative humidity on one end and low on the other, uh, you could have moisture transport. I remember taking um, a class with Professor Bob Litton many years ago and he was giving this example of uh, moisture diffusion in a desert climate like Arizona where he said there's moisture in the ground and there's dry air outside and so moisture can transport or diffuse from the ground beneath to the dry atmosphere up there because there's this gradient of relative humidity that drives moisture. So there are a number of things that actually drive moisture or cause this moisture transport. Can we measure it? Can we examine it? Yes. Um, this is one study that I cite here by Imad Kasim, who was at, um, at Texas A&M University at the time I was uh, there as well. He's right now a faculty member in Idaho. And he used this technique where he used a psychrometer, which is basically a sensor that measures moisture. And you can embed this psychrometer in an asphalt mixture specimen and uh, change the boundary conditions. So you can leave one boundary as dry and the other soaked in water and you can actually plant two or three or four of these sensors along the height of the specimen and uh, track how much moisture is building up. You can apply things like fix law and solve or back calculate for diffusion or transport or, or use any other suitable model that tells you the rate at which moisture goes from uh, one end to other given a certain boundary condition. It can be done, it's been measured, documented, these numbers are there in the literature. Um, but what comes next is very interesting. So the question is, uh, what is the uh, typical moisture, what is the rate at which moisture transports or travels in a given asphalt mixture? Uh, the answer is, it depends. In fact, uh, in my class I often ask uh, many questions and most of the time uh, by the end of the semester, the students learn to say that it depends is the right answer to almost any other qu any question to begin with. But what makes uh, uh, great engineers uh, great or, or engineers better at what they do is to understand what does it depend on. So uh, the the this is this was an interesting part or a continuation of that study in trying to figure out okay if different mixtures have different transport what is what is it about the mixture that affects the transport speed. 
my mentor, colleague, friend, Iyad Massad, and a couple of his students, Edith Arambulo, who's now at Texas A&M University, uh, they conducted this study where they examined the influence of air void structure of a compacted asphalt mixture on moisture transport and effect of that moisture content in an asphalt mixture uh, on its performance. Uh, this is a very nice graphical representation. You can see that you have one scenario here uh, which is very effective or open air voids and then you have a semi-effective uh, air voids and then you have an impermeable scenario, meaning you have a situation where you can have air voids such that they, are, they exist in the mixture, but they are not permeable, meaning water cannot get into or out of those air voids. And that's okay, because you have, you have essentially, you've created a scenario where water is, this, this whole thing is, is tight and does not allow water in or out. This extreme scenario is okay too. If you have a very open structure, like, like a permeable friction course or open graded friction course, you have a very open structure that allows water to go in, but it also allows it to drain out quickly so it doesn't trap the water, and that's fine too. It's this middle place here where you can get into trouble where the air void structure of your mix is such that water can get into the mix, but it doesn't get out easily. And in that scenario, you have water that gets trapped in, and because of the action of the vehicles, it develops internal pressure, creates erosion, so on and so forth. In fact, this uh, other study by Yed Masad and another one of his students, this was very interesting, uh, where they looked at fatigue damage. So if you look at the y-axis here, what you see is the ratio of fatigue life of a moisture conditioned specimen to the fatigue life of a dry specimen. And higher that number, the better off you are. Lower that number, meaning you have more moisture damage. And on this x-axis, you have average air voids, and you would, what you'd see is that the moisture damage, the amount of moisture damage actually increases as you get to smaller and smaller air voids, but then as you keep decreasing the air voids, you start getting back up there again. This idea was, was sort of labeled as the concept of pessimum air voids, meaning if you have a very open structure, water can come in and go out very easily. But if, if you, or if you have a very tight structure, water will never get into the mixture, and both of those scenarios are okay. It's the intermediate scenario where water gets in and gets trapped is what is problematic. So the concept of pessimum air voids. One caveat here I would like to mention here is that the, this study was very carefully controlled. Averages can be misleading. You can have several mixtures with same average air void but different air void structure. So this really is not the best metric to capture whether or not this happens, okay? Because air, you can have two different mixes with the exact same average air void but that average can be distributed in a very open structure or very close structure. So that's something to think about. And you have tools like X-ray tomography now that you can use to explore whether or not this, this kind of a mechanism is, is a problem. Let's go to the second part, erosion. Once water gets into the mix, okay, that's how. So we have air void structure, uh, we have distribution of those air voids, uh, basically that influence and, and relative humidity gradient, moisture gradient that drives water. And once water gets in, then you have uh, something called erosion. And first of all, this erosion was uh, from a study by Professor Tom Scarpus in Technical University of Delft and one of his then students who is now a faculty in Sweden, uh, Nikki Kringos, where they looked at this so-called pumping action where you would have these capillaries and water would move in and out of those capillaries at a very high rate. This particular uh, phenomenon basically is, is uh, combined with, uh, uh, basically what I want to point out here is that this particular phenomenon is more prominent in porous mixes. In regular dense graded mixes, you don't have that structure that facilitates this kind of a flow. But if you're talking about porous mixes, which are, by the way, in Netherlands for that scenario, for that study, they are very commonly used, uh, you can have this, this kind of an erosion action. Uh, again, uh, this, strictly speaking, we're talking about erosion combined with mechanical weakening and softening. And there was an interesting study uh, put together at the same time when all of these other studies with moisture damage were going on uh, that looked at modeling that erosion. Basically, you would have this open graded uh, friction course or permeable friction course. You would have moisture and you could model a wheel load and the rate at which moisture would try to escape from that structure and calculate what is the amount of damage it could do. The challenge over here is that in this case, this although the modeling is, uh, is, is excellent, you also need to run the model using the correct or more appropriate material properties. And sometimes that can be challenging because you have to 
a model is just what it is. It, it, it cannot run unless you give it the right mechanisms, unless you give it the right material properties to run off of. So um, the, getting the material properties for this kind of an erosion behavior is, is somewhat uh, non-trivial, I would say. Diffusion. So this is what happens at the pore. Think of this happening at the interface of the mortar and the open air white structure. While this is happening, moisture is also diffusing into the mortar. And uh, if you think about diffusion, uh, this is the same as moisture transport. Again, you could say, well, let's call this moisture transport. Yes, we can. It's just a terminology difference. I'd like to use the term diffusion here. Uh, and as moisture travels or water travels through the mortar, mortar meaning we use different terms here. You can think about fine aggregates mixed with uh, binder or you can think of, uh, uh, we also call it fine aggregate matrix. So as water diffuses through this matrix, it's traveling through bitumen and traveling through aggregate. And you can measure this diffusion. Uh, Dr. Vesconsolis, she's uh, uh, right here is uh, the speaker a couple of uh, uh, presentations ago. Uh, she actually did this study while she was at Texas A&M and it's a very simple way to do it. You can see what here you see is a, is a cylindrical specimen of an asphalt mortar, uh, very much the size of my pinky finger here, it's not very large, and it is submerged under water. Uh, the end, ends have been capped to create a very specific boundary condition. You would, what you would do is you would periodically take that specimen out and examine its weight and you catalog the weight over the period of time. And what you see here is typical mass gain because water is diffusing into that specimen. So you have this kind of data that is collected from a very simple experiment. All you need for this is a nice balance. Uh, and of course you need a lot of time because you have to go in and weigh it every so often. Uh, well, once you have the weight recorded as a function of time, in this case it's the same mortar except that uh, the diffusion was being measured at two different temperatures. Uh, one of the temperatures was a high temperature because uh, oftentimes in moisture damage tests we try to accelerate the moisture damage process by heating the water. Uh, and, and what you would do is once you have that, I've, I, I, I don't have the time or this is not the place to go over all the equations, but this is basically a Fickian diffusion model and it's a textbook solution. You can actually open the book, look for this boundary condition, look for this geometry and you can solve what is the diffusivity constant. So what you see here is a bar graph that shows that diffusivity constant for a number of different mortar combinations, combinations of asphalt binder and mineral aggregate. Um, under uh, two different temperatures. So this particular example, you can see these two bar graphs here uh, at room temperature and at uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is approximately uh, 39 degrees Celsius. So this is another property that can be measured. It's a function of the type of minerals you use in the mortar. It is a function of the type of bitumen. Some kinds of bitumen have higher diffusivity, will allow moisture to get in faster, others take time. Uh, moisture also diffuses through bitumen, so all of this is taken, so mortar is a composite and you, if you think about a composite, the moisture is traveling through bitumen. In, in very rare cases, if you have porous aggregate, the water will travel through the aggregate itself. Most of the time it's traveling through bitumen and you can also, another study by Dr. Vesconsolis was uh, using an FTIR to measure uh, the moisture transport and diffusion or diffusivity of water through the bitumen. Uh, in this case, what she used was an FTIR device with a little chamber that fit into the device to control the humidity or water content in there. And this peak over here that you see is actually a peak for the water. So you would soak the specimen and monitor how much the water was traveling into the specimen. And you get this kind of a chart where the peak is increasing with time. This is the intensity. Uh, you got the time and you got the wavelength. This is particular peak that you're tracking uh, and you do that and basically you can do the same kind of mechanics or mathematical calculations as you've done before to calculate diffusivity of binder. And, and what we've seen is the uh, diffusivity of binder or different kinds of bitumen that come from different sources is vastly different. So uh, the inherent ability of each binder to allow uh, water to flow through it is very different. The last part of this diffusion story is that we also found that diffusion is strongly history dependent. Before we started using binder 
for road construction, perhaps uh, thousands of years ago, Egyptians used it as a waterproofing agent. In fact, it is still used as a waterproofing agent, directly or indirectly, even today when you make asphalt shingles. So the question is, why does Binder even allow water to flow in? Uh, because it is supposed to be a waterproofing agent. And the answer is that, yes, Binder is a waterproofing agent. It does not allow water to flow in and it requires a very long time and constant exposure before water can ultimately get in. So the question is, if it stops raining now and it becomes sunny and bright tomorrow morning, does the process start over again? Does the water have to just sit there for six months at a stretch for water to diffuse? Or is it okay if the water diffuses and then dries up? That was this other study where we looked at diffusion where we cycled water, we exposed the material to water and then dried it, exposed it, dried it. And what we found was every time bitumen was exposed to water, it changed. It changed structurally so that the next time when it was dif is exposed to water, the diffusion was much faster. So what you see here is cycle one, cycle two, cycle three. You see the effect of these cycles. In the same amount of time, you would get more and more water for the same period of exposure, meaning what happened before, so even though the sun comes out tomorrow morning, uh, it's not like that the binder would go back to its original state. It is permanently changed. In fact, this is a very old, it's about six or seven years ago, we've, we've used this atomic force microscopy. I don't know with this light if it's clear or not, but you can see this was the structure of the original bitumen. This was the structure of the same bitumen under the same condition, except that it was exposed to water and dried. So there was permanent change in the structure of the bitumen. Uh, meaning you don't have to constantly expose the bitumen to water for months together to, to wait for moisture damage to occur. Every time you expose and you remove water, there's some change that is cumulative and it adds on. Cohesive softening, uh, meaning, okay, so water is getting it, it's getting, it's diffusing, so what? What does it do? How much damage does it cost? Uh, there are many studies that have looked at cohesive softening or damage in the binder or a combination of cohesive adhesive failure. Uh, one of the studies again is by Dr. Caro who's uh, in the audience, she spoke yesterday, uh, was to look at uh, the composite, the overall behavior of the composite. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. If you use composites uh, for, for moisture damage, you have to understand and recognize that all of these mechanisms are occurring together, or happening together, and so you have to tease out uh, the parameters of interest. But it was an interesting study uh, this study also used uh, a DMA specimen, a mortar specimen, again, the same specimen that you'd seen submerged before in water, that same tiny little specimen with uh, asphalt binder and sand, not sand, but the fine aggregates that come from the mix, uh, and you could construct fatigue damage curve. So what you see here uh, uh, is the probability of moisture damage expressed as a ratio, uh, and over here you have number of cycles, and you have uh, each one of these curves represents a different material or different material combination with uh, additives and so forth. The point here is that uh, you, can, you can use this kind of test to measure the sensitivity of these mortars, the ability of these mortars to resist damage, the softening effect of these mortars, etc., uh, by using these kind of mechanical tests and exposing these materials to moisture damage. Uh, of course, higher this number, the, uh, or the higher curve indicates uh, more susceptibility to damage or higher probability to damage. Ideally, though, what you want to do is isolate the effect of binder. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. a number of these tests have also appeared where um, the, the simplest name I would give is this poker chip test. Earlier today, uh, Jeffrey was talking about uh, strength tests where you're measuring the, the failure or capacity of the material. So the poker chip test is really where it's called a poker chip because you really have a sandwich of a thin film of bitumen between two metal plates and, and you pull on it. Uh, yesterday in the lab tour, I saw that uh, one of the devices sitting there was um, a, a patty tester, pneumatic adhesion tester. So although we use a very fancy device to run this test, this is something that you could run off of a very uh, uh, inexpensive device like the patty tester, which you already have. And what you see here is cohesive failure and you see the effect of aspect ratio, so on and so forth. We've studied this in depth to identify at what point does fracture nucleate, at what point do you have failure, and so on and so forth. But the idea being that uh, so far, this configuration has been used to study adhesive failure, but to the best of my knowledge, it's not been used to study cohesive softening and binder, and that's something that uh, I believe uh, should also be looked at. Um, 
<coughs> so this, this is probably helping uh, to study the effect of binder or moisture in the binder in isolation. Uh, stripping. The last piece of the puzzle is once moisture gets to the interface, it strips the binder from the aggregate surface and the aggregate breaks loose and pops out. Uh, so this is a thermodynamic driven process, thermodynamic driven process meaning once you have an interface like this where you have water sitting at the interface, the water gets between the aggregate and the asphalt binder, separates it and creates a new interface. Why does this happen? Because this happens because water is highly polar, it prefers the mineral surface more than the binder prefers the mineral surface. It's just a competition between the binder and the aggregate surface uh, versus water and the aggregate surface. Uh, I, I try cooking sometimes and I burn things and you have organic material that is burnt on top of a metal plate and it's very difficult to clean. So what do you do? You put it under water for an hour or two with soap preferably and this is exactly what happens is water prefers the metal surface, delaminates the organic material uh, and you don't have to work very hard. Then you scrub just a little you have a clean pan. It's the same kind of thing that's happening on the roads. Water sits, acts, causes the stripping and then a vehicle bowl goes by and just causes the, the thing to delaminate the aggregate particle to pop out. You can measure surface energy of these three materials here, water, aggregate, bitumen and you can calculate this energy transaction that takes place and that energy transaction uh, is less than zero meaning thermodynamic favors to go into this moisture damage configuration than not going there. Uh, and, and the next thing you can do is, so what we did was we found out that for a material compatibility, uh, this, had, this, this material should be, this parameter should be as small as possible. We also looked at other factors like wettability, which is the competition between the molecules of the bitumen with itself versus the surface beneath it. Uh, and that parameter is right here. And then we also looked at mechanical interlock effect, which is captured by the specific surface area of the aggregate. So this is purely based on thermodynamics, this is purely based on mechanical interlock and if you look at this energy ratio parameter, uh, we've done studies, carefully controlled studies, uh, I'm sorry, this, these are just two devices, the Wilhelmi plate device and the sorption device that can be used to measure these parameters and then the two studies or some, some of the studies that we did, we have shown that if you look at mechanical tests of carefully controlled specimens and look at this uh, energy ratio over here, the energy parameter here, you'd see that there's a strong correlation between the two, meaning you can, you can tell when the materials are not compatible by, by running these surface energy measurements. Um, this next part is we're almost two-thirds of the way done. How are we doing on time? Uh, the next part is, is application. So this is okay. We've taken moisture damage and we have sliced it and diced it into very tiny little steps. We've tried to find out how water migrates into the mix, how it migrates through the motor, how it migrates through the bitumen, how it gets to the bitumen aggregate surface. What is the thermodynamics of that stripping? Added to all of this, we still have complications of things like what happens with oxidative aging, what happens with temperature, how does this diffusivity change, how does uh, the, the energy ratio change with temperature and all of that. And I was thinking about this and I wondered that we have taken this understanding so far but how do we take all of these bits of knowledge and, and turn, some, turn it into something that is useful for practitioners. I, I was in, sort of I came across this uh, author from Argentina, uh, Jorge Burgues, and he writes many short stories and this is a short story. I asked one of my students to translate this into Spanish. Um, for those of you um, who speak English, I'm sorry, but for the part of the larger audience, I'll let you read it. I'll pause for two seconds here. You think it's enough time? Yeah? All right. So this actually shows the desperation. It's a story that reflects the desperation of scientists. We, we try to slice and dice and understand things to such precision that ultimately we create something that is so large and humongous. 
that is, that is extremely detailed and precise, but how do we turn it into something that is useful? How do we turn it into a map that can help the person who's trying to navigate places on a day-to-day -day basis? This was sort of uh, part two. This leads into the part two of my story. So let's start with indicator tests, or what typically referred to as torture tests. There are things like Hamburg wheel tracking device, the boil test, the, the wet to dry ratio of parameters. Uh, we are all familiar with this device. Initially, when I was studying moisture damage, I used to hate Hamburg and I say, this is useless. I mean, it doesn't tell us this or that. But over time, I've come to appreciate that it's not useless, it's just useful in a different way. If you are a practitioner, if you want to look at the sum effect of all these mechanisms and you want a quick test, uh, it's a torture test. What it doesn't do is it doesn't tell you if, if you have a material uh, that fails, it doesn't tell you why. But if you are doing something on a production basis, on a routine basis, you want a good quality control test, um, that's not a bad test. Something like boil test, it was again not a very fundamental measure, uh, but it is something you can coat aggregates, boil it, and quickly see what is the compatibility or what is the relative resistance between materials. The wet to dry ratio, you can run the indirect tensile strength ratio, you can run fatigue tests, you can run dynamic modulus tests before and after moisture conditioning. These are good tests, they're indicator tests. The only problem with these tests is that they don't tell you why. If I have a bad mix, that's all. That's what it's gonna tell me is that this mix is bad. It doesn't tell me what is bad with it, what is wrong with it, and how can I fix it? And that is where I think when we take what we do on a daily basis in practicing labs and DOT specifications, and then take it a step further and tie it to fundamental properties, we can answer those questions. For, uh, just as an example, uh, let's look at this Hamburg wheel tracking device. Uh, one of the things that uh, I was working with Texas Department of Transportation, they said, we had this mix, it failed Hamburg, all we did was we substitute the binder with the same grade binder, but it comes from a different refinery, the mechanical properties are the same, suddenly it passed with flying colors. Why? We don't know. Well, that's where the fundamental tests can give you some advantage. Uh, so this one example, the first example I'm giving is surface energy, where you can, you can do something like this. This is what we did for the Texas Department of Transportation. We created a catalog. Simply speaking, we had in, that, in several of the Texas districts, you had these aggregates, about nine or 10 aggregates here, 10 or 12 different, 13 different binders. And if you want to test how each aggregate works with each binder, that's 130, 140 different mixes, multiply by replicate, multiply by two tests, and you can have five years in the lab doing this. What we did was we just measured surface free energy and we cataloged all the properties. This is all theoretically computed by simple measurements of aggregate and binder properties. This index is the energy ratio. The green shows bad, good and the orange shows bad over here. And you can see that for any given binder, if you tie this binder with, depending on the aggregate type, sometimes you have a scenario that can be really bad. Sometimes you have a scenario that can be really good. And the same thing goes the other way. Let's say you're working in this area, you're dealing with limestone aggregates. Well, you can choose a binder that is really good or you can choose a binder that's really bad. But if you don't have this knowledge and you say, you know, I just buy whatever 64 minus 22 binder, you could end up here or here, there's no telling. But this kind of a fundamental approach tells us why my DOT engineer saw what he saw when he said, I just changed the binder and things started working, I don't know why. So that's where these fundamental properties come in. Here's another example from another colleague uh, and friend of mine, Dr. Alvarez uh, from uh, Colombia. And he just finished this study and he was kind enough to share the results with me. He, what he did was he looked at the uh, ratio, the, the volumetric ratio of fine aggregates in different mastics. So he changed the volumetric ratio of fines in mastics and measured what the surface energy of the bulk of that mastic was uh, based on these changes. And what he found was there was really an optimum. If he had too much fines in there, the surface energy would drop to a point where it was not good in adhesion. If you had too little, the surface energy was again indicating that you did not have a good adhesion. There was really an optimum range uh, that he found from this, uh, this study, which really shows uh, the dust to binder ratio versus filler concentration. And these bars basically show you what, what is a good optimum window. It's a very interesting paper. Uh, where he, he combines this result with other mechanical properties and shows that, you know, this study gives you this optimum range, this study gives you this optimum range, moisture damage gives you this optimum range. So you can combine all these optimums and find out the slice of dust to binder ratio that you can use. Again, this is a practical tool based on very fundamental knowledge, fundamental approach, and so forth. 
Last one is an example from here. Uh, if, I hope uh, Alejandra recognizes this because she, this was part of her study, where she looked at different additives and different aggregates in an effort to find the best additive and the best additive ratio that would work with a specific aggregate and binder. Now, if she had to do this with mixtures, with IDT or whatever, it would take her a very long time. Instead, she, made, she conducted uh, surface energy measurements, uh, and this is work coming right out of this university here, and, and showed how using surface energy, she, uh, you know, you could get different performance with different aggregates. Not only that, these different bars within each group show different concentrations of a particular additive. So if you add a certain concentration of additive, you get best performance. You add too much of it, again, the performance dips down. This is not the end, but perhaps this is a good starting point. Perhaps you can say that in this particular case, uh, let's try this and see using mechanical tests if this really works. So these fundamental tools give you a good, uh, good guide into how, how you can proceed with things. The last, uh, we're in 28, so getting closer. The last thing you can do is, is computational modeling. So computational modeling is we talked about all these little mechanisms, water transport, diffusion, softening, uh, stripping, adhesive failure. Computational modeling is a way where you tie all these mechanisms, the geometry, all these constitutive models and material properties uh, into a single model and, and understand how these different pieces of mechanisms work together in moisture damage. Again, I borrowed a slide from a paper uh, that uh, I was fortunate to co-author with Dr. Caro here, uh, which shows uh, a real aggregate mixture over here and how, it, how the moisture content changes over time because the, and if you change the diffusivity of the material, how you would see the change over time. If you change the softening parameters, if you change the stiffness of the material, what would happen and how the moisture damage would progress over time. Again, so this particular model combines two or three different things. It combines diffusivity or moisture transport. It combines the effect of stop softening. It combines the effect of stripping or adhesive failure. So you can use computational models to, to tie these things together. But then again, you may say that, you know, the computation models, I'm a practitioner, I have this million dollar road to build, I don't have time for this. But uh, the people who do this, they should be encouraged to do this because you can take such models and first of all, you can improve your understanding of why these failures occur. You can then also use these models to fine tune your specifications, like the example that I showed earlier where, you know, there's a dust to uh, filler ratio. If you take these fundamental ideas, take these models, you can do some kind of an analysis and say, you know what, for these materials in this region, perhaps it is best that we don't specify a range of X to Y, we specify only, say, 1.1 X to 0.8 Y and stay within that narrower window. It's better to tighten that specification because it makes a lot of difference. In contrast, you can also say that, you know, this parameter really doesn't affect us. It really is not applicable to our materials. So we don't necessarily have to track it and specify it and, and do quality control on it all the time. So there are a number of ways in which we can take this fundamental understanding and bring it together. My last thoughts is that uh, I think progress really comes or progress really happens when the practitioners, contracts, uh, contractors, uh, the agency, highway agency, uh, policy makers, they all sit together and work on a single platform and try to resolve these issues. We should try to interact with each other more, make sure that as a university researchers, the tools that I produce are really applicable to you, are really useful to you. As a practitioner, as a DOT, as an agency, uh, make sure that you tell us what your problems are so that we are not chasing a dream that does not, or some problem that does not exist in reality. Um, we also are somehow compelled to think that there is this one magic test and parameter that if we put it in a machine, press a button, it'll give out a number and that will solve all the world's problem and we can specify that number and everything is good. I personally believe there is not such a single thing. Physicists have forever pursued the dream of a single unifying model that explains everything. Uh, and as asphalt engineers, I think we do the same to some extent. But I think it's a good dream to chase because in the pursuit of that dream, I think we try to understand the problem better, we try to diagnose the problem better and take these little pieces uh, and improve our body of knowledge that can ultimately be of, of great use. 
Uh, again, many thanks to many of the researchers who have tolerated me working by their side and, and asking annoying questions, why are you doing this and that. And they've been kind enough to let me be part of their research. Some of them are right here. Um, uh, and uh, uh, my, my thanks to them because everything that I've learned is not just my effort, which is a very small slice of all of this, but by working with a, a lot of these researchers. And thank you very much. Uh, before I end though, here is I'm going to break. I have slide 31 out of 30. Isn't that strange? Uh, I, would, I took permission from uh, Dr. Louis that uh, I could show this slide. Uh, we've been working for the last two or three years. Uh, the people involved in academia related to pavement engineering, and we call pavement science and engineering because really there's a lot of science in it, uh, to develop what we call as the, or what we have now formally organized as the Academy of Pavement Science and Engineering. Uh, students, uh, faculty, adjunct faculty, researchers associated with universities, uh, they are all members. We, we will in future open it to the industry as well. But even today, if you're from the industry and you're looking for students, you can perhaps access the uh, student directory from this organization. It's newly launched. Uh, we are still uh, creating the pieces. I mean, yesterday afternoon we finished the complete website launch and everything. So very soon you may receive some email. Uh, Dr. Luis uh, is one of the founding members along with uh, Dr. Caro. She is also one of the executive officers. So um, it, it's, a, it's a great place. And the intent of this is for the civil engineering community and the society at large to recognize that a, a pavement science and engineering is not something trivial. It's not that you mix two things and just throw it out there. There's a lot of science to it. There's a lot of mechanics to it. And you need really well-trained professionals and intellectuals driving uh, this industry from both research standpoint and the practice standpoint. So we hope that this would be a platform in the future to, to represent the importance of pavement to the society and also to connect us as pavement scientists, engineers, and, and practitioners in the future um, into one platform. Now that was 31 out of 30 and I'm done. Thank you very much.